All that we've written here has been targeting the main area of the design, the main section of blog. Now we're going to target the sidebar. We didn't set up the HTML any way very special, meaning that we have a section which has a class of blog, but we don't have the aside with any sort of class or ID. And we could add a class there as well to write our code to be more specific, but since we've only got an aside for the sidebar, we can simplify it by simply targeting aside. <laughs> Anywhere where we have the aside tag to target our sidebar, do the following. We've only got one aside, so we'll be fine here. Here we're going to say float left with 25% padding 0001M. When this was being designed, when CSS was being invented, no one had the good idea to think about that. So basically, it always happens that when you're doing these left and right columns, they're almost always float left, because they're trying to create one inline element. This one is floating to the left, and this one is floating to the left. But the trick then is the widths. We had 70% for the left and 25 for the right. Now again, it would make sense. 70% for the left, 30% for the right, because we get 100%. But it's down to 25% because we have to take into account the inherent built-in margins and paddings. So with a little troubleshooting, a little trial and error, I figured out that 25% is enough space so that it lines up nice, and there is the space between the two columns. You can put 30% to try it out, you know, it's always a good idea to kind of experiment. And then now it doesn't it doesn't obey anymore. It's down to the bottom. Because the 70% was too much and it pushed down the rest. So some amount, 25 was good, allows for a left and a right column. So you can always try to see if it works with equal values, but one value will often have to be a little bit less to take into account the various margins and paddings. So on the padding, this is the space inside of the sidebar, and I'm saying at the top, zero, although it's not fully zero because there's a heading there. On the right, zero, there's still some extra space bottom and on the left. It, it mattered to me more on the left here so that the text is not lined up exactly on the left. Or that is touching the left line. Aside section A. I'm going to target links. targeted. Right now they're behaving in an inline fashion. They're all in one line. I want to break them up into their own lines. So we'll have display block. Each one of them takes up its own block. Didn't we have to do the opposite for the bullet points? So if we go back to where we did that, those bullet points were originally block level elements, and we had to turn them display inline to take away that ability. Now we're doing the opposite. These were originally on one level, one line, and we did display block to make them all their own line. So a note here move each link to its own line.
opposite of just for the notes somewhere back line 73 in my case what we just did is like the opposite of display inline line 73 now of course the problem with uh, making notes this way about line 73 is that once you start to add or remove code that line 73 is not the same line 73 anymore A little bit of padding and other elements to make it look nice. Padding 075, border dash bottom, one pixel solid gray. Text decoration, none. What's text decoration again? Removes the, underline. Removes the underline on links, yes. That simple collection of links in HTML now is being separated. Nicer color, a little line between each one via the border. Starting to look like a real sidebar with links. Maybe instead of gray, uh, midnight blue. So we're going to do a hover effect, just like we hover over the nav bar. We're going to hover over these recent posts. So next line, we're targeting a side section A hover. No space between the A and the colon. This is being attached to the A. If we did a space, it would be like a hover inside of an A, inside of a section, and that's not right. It's the A class, pseudo class, attached to the A tag. And we're going to do the same sort of color that we did with the midnight blue and antique white. Background color, antique white, color of the text, midnight blue. Hover over, you get a cool color that appears. And then for even more interesting design, border left, five pixels, solid orange red. but only on the left, solid, and the color, red-orange, like I use over here for consistency. The original color of the text was orange-red, now it's used as a part of sidebar. If you put that even thicker, like 15, effect is like that, kind of like that a little bit more. Now, be careful, uh, because this is moving over, I think it's fine, but it's very easy that when we change some of these sizes, stuff moves around. You know, if we were doing this sort of thing on this, this would probably push your text around in a weird way. Five pixels here is fine because it's a block level element. It's pushing this.
this element to make space for this element. Over here it would matter, over here not so much, and it looks nice. I want to target this text. That's an H3 or something, isn't it? So a side section H3, and then we can control it. Let's confirm. Oh, it's, it's an H2. So recent posts inside of section, inside of a side. This is an example where we can just say also a side H2. We could specify section, but this whole sidebar is simple enough that this will work. Any H2s inside of an aside. That's that. Or an aside which then has a section which then has an H2. That'll work also. Padding. 3M at the top, 0 all around, color, I want to make that color consistent with the other color over here, which was light slate gray, I think it already is actually, um, oh okay well, for the moment I'll put red. We might not actually need to put anything there because of inheritance. If we do put a color of light slate gray, oh, it is different. It looks really similar, but okay. So uh, I was going to say that that color was originally inheriting this color, these colors. That's fine. I thought it was the same color, but now that I look at it again, it is slightly different. The color of that. A side heading, light slate gray, or any color you like. Font family, times, times new Roman, serif. And then font size 2M. So making that text a little larger on the side there. So that's our that's our um, sidebar. I want to target the footer. So footer. Just the font size, 0.75M, 
make the footer text a little smaller so I didn't have to be very specific at all here there I think there's an h4 there or a p or something well because of inheritance on the top level parent the footer have all of the text go down to 75 percent Alright, so go ahead and load up the project in the browser and I'm looking at it and it's pretty complete. There might be some things here and there I want to fix up. Here's how I would go about tweaking things because eventually this is going to go to project two homework based on this structure and a little bit more that we're still gonna, we're still gonna learn. You're gonna take this as a starting point to create a website. We're not quite there yet, but that's what we're going toward. So that means when you start to use your own graphics and your own fonts, we're going to talk about editing fonts in a moment, Google fonts. Once you start using your own graphics and your own fonts and stuff, these values that I have given you here might not work the same anymore. Now, because you chose an interesting font, there's too much space. Or the image that you chose, you chose rectangular images instead of vertical, you need to change some of these values. So I've given you values that work for what I've given you. But once you start to work on your own, you're going to need to figure out some of your own values. So let me show you how I would troubleshoot or how I would figure out how to do those values. I'm in Firefox, but this also works in Chrome. What you want to do is, let's say, I want to figure out the amount of space right here. There's too much space, and less space. So probably this element here if I can target this element, I can figure out this space. So in Firefox or Chrome, if you right click one of these elements you want to work with, if you right click, you should see something that says inspect element, either in Chrome or Firefox. So try that. Right click the recent posts, inspect element. In Firefox, I get this developer's panel at the bottom. And then on Chrome, it goes to the right. We've seen this a little bit before. And Chrome here is a inspector. I think um, uh, Firefox is inspector. I think Chrome calls it elements. So this, from this tab, is all of our HTML code. You see the structure of HTML. And then you're going to see the CSS that applies to it. And I'm seeing a side, h2, etc. And it's telling me in my style sheet file, line 182. So it's telling me where, what I already know. There's my HTML, there's my CSS. But what's cool about this is you can make quick changes right here. You can make changes in this inspector to test things out. For example, padding. If I click there, double click, I can change that to, you know, pa uh, padding of 13. And look at how huge that space becomes. I can do the opposite and put 1M, and it moves it up higher. So I can change values here in my inspector to figure out what's the right value. This is not changing my original code. I have to go back to line 182 and change that exactly. It's a good thing that it doesn't change the code. Because I can go to anyone's website, right click, inspect element, and start playing 
with some of these bits of code. And there we go, I just hacked Google. Well, it's not really changing their code. I just refresh the browser and it goes away. But that inspector, that right-click inspect element, will let you look at the code of any website that exists and play with the various bits of HTML and CSS and even add properties that are not originally there. And so I've changed the Google home page on my computer, not on the Google servers. So here with your own code, I figured out, OK, in my case with my font and my design and everything, I think it's going to be better for me to have a padding of 0 to 5 instead of 3. I put 3 on purpose. But then now, via this inspector in your browser and testing it a little bit, I figure that out because it's a little annoying to write the code, save the code, run the code. Once I've got the code kind of complete, I can look at it in the browser and quickly make changes here to figure out what's the right value. If this refreshes, it loses what you did. It goes back to that, way too much space. But that was line 182. So if you want to, line 182, it might be better to have that as a 0 0.25 or something whatever you have figured out. Actually, I would really like it so that that lines up with that. I'd like that to be on the same level. So changing these values here, a little bit at a time, 135, 155, 1 1.5, 1 1.25, 1.1. 1 .1. So that would have been really annoying to edit it in Notepad, save it and run it, edit it, run it, edit, save it, run it, back and forth. If you just change it in the browser, you get dynamically your result. And I figured out actually 1.1 seems to line up with that. 3 was too much and 0 to 5 was too little, or whatever design you want. When you hover over an element in the HTML code, it highlights it, the invisible boxes that it's made out of. Hovered over, recent posts, there's that element. I forget which is which, but then you've got the color of the actual element, the color of the um, padding, I believe. The color of the padding is orange in Firefox and the color of the margin is purple. So every browser is a little bit different, but you're seeing the margin and the padding. You're seeing how it lines up. It's not quite there, actually. So I need like 1.0 or something. Might not be able to line up exactly, but that's really close. Hovering over your elements. Another very useful part of this inspector is here. You're going to see this element picker. You can hover over the stuff in the HTML, and it'll highlight over here for you then to edit the CSS. Or you can turn on the element picker and hover over what you're trying to target. Uh, that's what I want to edit. Click here, and then, then you click here, and it will highlight in the code and tell you what needs to be changed. So I can click, hover, and click up there and then it highlighted. This is on my HTML, H2, class H2 top section, and the code that is currently affecting it is section, space, H2 top, on line 186. Margin, font family, font size. Yes? So 
So when I hover over an elder, I see like blue color and orange. So is blue the padding and orange the margin? Are you in Chrome or Firefox? Chrome. Uh, let me confirm. Uh, because the brow each browser shows slightly different colors. Let me run it in Chrome. But yeah, one of them is going to be padding and one of them is going to be margin. It's like in the box. It says what it is. So. Oh, okay, yes. So when you look over here, the main element, the padding, is going to be a green, the border, and then the margin is going to be a peach color, I guess. So there's your colors in Chrome. In Firefox... Firefox doesn't. Uh, oh, here we go. In Firefox, they have it hidden over here in their computed sub tab. You have rules and computed. So the main element, purple, is going to be padding, borders black, margins yellow. So every browser does it slightly different, but you can see there in Chrome that it's margin and padding. So if I'm hovering over some element, featured post, I think it's too much space up there. I can see what that is. Now if I if I do if I do my selector and then I click on the read more, so I've selected that element. Another part of this, this is one of the most important panels you need to know as a web designer. Every web browser has this. A few years ago, you needed to download a plugin. There was this thing that was very famous called Firebug which was a way for us to, in Firefox, to examine the code of a site. But now all the web browsers have it built in, basically F12 on the keyboard. It's a pretty complex screen because we've got a tab to inspect things, to read the JavaScript console debug and all of this other advanced stuff. You've got a column for the HTML and a column for the CSS and then tabs and that. So a lot of complexity. I would recommend you spend some time just looking at all of the screens. What is this screen about? What does that one do? I don't know what this is, but let me click on it. It's okay. You know, you've got these other options here too. One more thing about here. In, in Firefox, at the bottom I get here also a sort of a path. Chrome is going to show it. Um, Chrome is going to show it over here. Not as obvious. I like the one in Firefox better. But it's showing you a path, a structure. It's best to read it from right to left. I've clicked on an element, which is an A tag, which is inside of a P tag, which is inside of an article, inside of a section with a class inside of a div with a class, inside of the body, inside of HTML. So I can go up and down that tree. You know, I click on article, and that jumps me up to the parent element, article, and all of the CSS that affects it. There's my clear both with 100%. I go back up higher, div wrapper. There's the div that I created to hold the whole project. There's the CSS for it, and in this case, background color is crossed out. You're going to see some things here and there that have been crossed out because of the cascade in cascading style sheets. Some code elsewhere has taken over that, and um, it's replaced it somewhere. So in this case, the simple background color was replaced somewhere further down the line with a different background color. Going back to body, I see there was that background color that was set and the background image. So when you use float, so does float actually put, it puts something else over something else? No, float is supposed to be about we use float to create the left and the right columns. We floated, we should have floated section to the left and then a side to the left, just so that they stay on the same line. So like, 
I'm looking for the elements right now, and so when I click the edge group of Spider-Man, mm -hmm. I see the box, but it goes over the image. So I didn't know if the image actually is over the that entire box. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a good point. So um, there could there, that could happen as well. Uh, a few of us that had the problem that our picture went outside the border, that's an example of seeing that, yeah, these things technically can float on top of each other. But the confusing part is we have the generic word float, you know, something floats on top of another thing. But we have the CSS word of float, which is a specific thing. So it's kind of hard to separate the two, but yeah, we're seeing here that this H group sort of seems like, well, it looks like it's floating on top of that just because this whole element is like that. But it has to represent it this way because of the amount of padding there is here and the amount of space that this has to push this over. So it's not that the float command is, is making it float how you think, it's just that we're using it to align the elements next to each other. If you had three, if you wanted to do three columns, all of them would be float left. All three would be float left, and then I'd have to do the math. Thirty-three percent, thirty-three percent, thirty percent. So this path that that you have here is going to be very important when you get more complex, because one element is inside of another, inside of another, and sometimes what you had selected to try to target is not exactly what is really going to affect things. You have to oftentimes go back to one level to the parent to then figure out what CSS should be changed. Yes? Does the flow work like an array list? So like when you add something, it goes to the left of it? You can kind of think about it that way as an array list. Yeah, it's all part of the same sort of group or element. So it does add it in sequence. Uh, what you can also check is uh, when you've got some element selected, you will see its various rules. And then you see check marks next to them. You can turn off that code quickly. For example, let me back up to the body. On the body, I had a background image. If I want to turn off that background color for a moment, I did, or background image, I just click the check mark next to one of those, and then it goes back like that before we made any changes. So to see what that looks like, if the background image never loads up, if the server is is down, the light the light gray background is what was there originally. So this is a screen we'll look at more, but definitely this developer's console, the inspector, is a very valuable thing to, to use as a web designer. It's perhaps a little overwhelming to talk about it now, because there's so much to look at, but I definitely recommend that you, uh, that you look at it yourself, click on things, check these different options and panels. A lot of it might not make sense at the moment, but it's good to look at it. And then the Chrome one is a little different. It went on the right side. Um, you can move it to the left or to the right and such by clicking on the dots. Put it to the right, put it bottom, put it left, load it so it's on a separate window. When you've got nice big monitors, you can separate them out. But here again, I have the option to click that select an element. I can hover over. The colors are a little bit different here. Clicked and it shows it's H2. Here's the code for it. Here's the color coding. And here you've got this element in this element, in this one, in this one, in this one. Okay, let's um, let's look at how we can um, change fonts. We saw that the 
the time that we mentioned about fonts, we wrote font family. And then we set a list, set a list of fonts. We wrote a list of fonts. And when we first talked about fonts, I had said if we use the chiller font, we can use that interesting font. That font has to be on everyone's computer in order for them to see it. So if you're on a Mac, you don't have the chiller font. So we would try to look at the Times font. A better thing to do is to link to Google fonts. Google, of course, this big website that everyone knows about, they have a whole repository of fonts. And we can connect to the Google Fonts library and use their font in our project. And everyone will be able to see the font. So if we go to fonts.google.com, let's look at this screen first before adding the code. Let's go to fonts.google.com. This says that there are 821 fonts. Maybe we can choose from all of these fonts. Some of them look kind of plain. But on the right side, let's say, show me handwritten fonts. So I can turn on and off these options here, just for fun, if you go to handwriting. Some nice looking ones here. Pacifico. Okay, so let's say we let's say we found a cool font we want to use. In my case, Pacifico. You can click on a font title to see even more details about it. Lots of details. And we have a few options. So let's say I want to use Pacifico. Whichever one you found, I want to use Pacifico. You click on the plus sign. That says I have one. I have one font selected. We can choose 40 fonts, but let's keep it simple with one font for the moment. I've got Pacifico. At the bottom, it should say I've got one family selected. If I click on that, it then tells me how to use it. I need to embed the font, and then I can specify it in CSS. To embed your selected fonts on your web page, copy this code and paste into the head of your HTML document. It looks like a style sheet. Link href rel style sheet. It's a style sheet. So we're connecting to the googleapis.com server, CSS Family Pacifico. So that is going to have our website connect to the Google server to activate the font. Then, wherever we want to use that font, we have to specify font family Pacifico in quotes. And then that font will appear. This one says Pacifico uh, comma cursive. So this is the generic one. If the person, for whatever reason, that cannot load Pacifico font, then the most basic load the cursive font. I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to select this first, this first embed part. Select it and copy. We'll go back to our HTML file paste it into the head. So where this says standard, I'm going to select and copy back to the HTML, back to the head.
we already have one link to a style sheet. The order of this stuff does matter. So if I were to paste it here, that's going to give us different results than if I were to paste it here. And I would say, paste it first before your custom CSS. It's better to um, it's better to have this general definition of what it is and then our customization of it. So from the Google website I copied that and pasted it first and then our custom CSS. I noticed that they wrote rel second, you wrote it first, that doesn't matter. href, href, doesn't matter. But I would have I, I like to write rel first and then href second. So that's part one. You paste the CSS, uh, the link to the CSS file. Part two, depending on your font, you have to uh, write the name of the font. So however it's written for you, that's how you write it wherever you've got font family. In my case, it's Pacifico in quotes. So I've got the example in the CSS line 185 single quotes double quotes same thing pacifico pacifico and now i've got i've got the link to the to the google font in my html file and now i've got the definition of using pacifico in my css and i've got a nice font So if I wanted to use more than one font, I could get the link to the other font and paste it and then simply use it. But actually, there's a short way to use more than one font. Google gives you the option right here. If you if you select another font like Indie Flower and you look at the code you can put the, the pipe character the vertical line between each name of the font and Indie Flower has a space I guess so it's Indie plus flower then the pipe and Pacific so basically the pipe character you can use the same one line of, C of HTML, but you separate each of the fonts with a pipe character. So now I've got Gloria Hallelujah, which is Gloria plus Hallelujah, pipe, Indie plus flower pipe, Pacifico. So now all three of these fonts can be used in my project. And I just specify the name here. It's got to be in quotes, Indie space flower, Gloria Hallelujah, space. I bet this one, Shadows into Light, is three. Yeah, right there. Shadows plus into plus light. And then when I use it in my CSS, in quotes, Shadows into Light. I'm just going to keep it with one font at the moment. If you want to use more than one font, you can. And I was looking at these handwriting fonts. These are nice, interesting fonts. These are the ones that are like sans serif. These are like very basic fonts, kind of like Arial. But if you don't want to be as simple as Arial, you have these other ones, Railway.
So if I want to use railway in my project, I have Pacifico pipe railway. And then maybe in my body, I set the font. Font family railway. I'll keep it simple with one font, but you can, you can explore that. Okay, so um, this is the project. A little while ago, last week, it was uh, very different. Right, we took this super simple structure. We took that super simple structure, and then with a lot of CSS, we have this. So this is very common that the CSS is the most complex thing compared to HTML because of this design. We got um, 92 lines of HTML, 192 lines of CSS. We're not done yet, but we're going to wrap up for, for the day because when we start fresh next time, we're going to then start to deal with making the project mobile friendly. Um, here's one thing before we wrap up. Uh, run the project in Chrome not Firefox. Let's run it in Chrome. I want to show you something here. So run your, your project in Chrome. F12 to open the developers console. And then we've got this icon here. I'm not sure if I mentioned it before, but we'll be using this. If you click on Toggle Device Toolbar, this is a way for us to emulate or pretend to use a mobile device. Right now I'm on a desktop. I want to see what the project looks like on a mobile device. I cannot get the project onto my mobile device yet. We haven't talked about uploading it to a server. But if I want to sort of test it on a mobile device, it, one of the best ways is in Chrome. You turn on Toggle Device Toolbar. And then on the top, you will see various devices. So we've got iPhone 6, Galaxy S5. You have more devices here, too. But just pick one of these. Like and then it's going to show your project as if it was inside of, a, of an iPhone. Or if you go to the Nexus 5, it looks like a device like that. The problem is it looks really small. It's not mobile friendly. I have the zoom up here, but that, that's different. This is what's very common with a non-mobile friendly project, <laughs> that it doesn't look good. It's, too, it's either too small or too big for the person's device. So you've probably been to a website where something is really small and then you have to zoom in. You do the pinch to zoom in and all of that. Well, um, you know, I want to do the same thing here. It's, it doesn't quite fit. Look at how small that text is on the copyright down there. It's not mobile friendly. So we're going to use Chrome plus this device emulator plus a bunch of CSS next time to make this mobile friendly, to make this grow and shrink and look nice based on the person's device.
and I don't have handy the example that does that, but remember the first time that I showed this, this is going to change eventually so that the sidebar moves to the bottom. I don't have enough space to show the sidebar and the main bar. So via, via CSS, we're going to move the sidebar down. We're going to increase the size of these things. And then this top tab right here doesn't look so good that way. We're going to make these back to block level elements nice big clickable elements via CSS. CSS can detect the size of the screen and change itself based on what the person's screen is. But we'll start fresh with that because it's, you know, a hundred more lines of CSS at least. We'll start with that on Monday. And uh, this, is the, this is the project up to this point so far. It's coming along. There's still more to do, but Look at how far we've come. So we're going to have lab until 10.45-ish uh, if you need it. Uh, no homework yet. Uh, I did send out an email saying that the homework has been graded. If you need clarification on your points, uh, see me. If not, then that's it for the moment. We'll be back on Monday, and we'll continue the, the project.